And I'm actually preaching to myself this morning. Wow. All right, I'm preaching to myself. Over the last few months, the path has been rather bumpy, to say the least, with one thing or another. On all occasions, it's been very painful. Got to the point of saying, what's the point of going on? What's, what's, what's it all about? A little boy was leading his sister up a mountain path, and the way was not easy. And the little girl protested, this isn't a path at all. It's all rocky and bumpy. And her brother replied, sure, the bumps are what we climb on. That's a remarkable piece of philosophy. Yeah. Let me ask, what do you do with the bumps in your life? One of my passions is history, much to her dismay, because I'm forever watching history programs. But if you do a study of the great names of history, you find that most of them had a very difficult life. Yeah. A casual glimpse, and you might only see the success and the rewards. But if you take a closer look, the truth is revealed. And a typical of that uh, example is Winston Churchill. Absolutely. <coughs> I don't know whether you were aware of it, but he was a man who climbed over one misfortune after another misfortune. Never. Never. And by the way, Nelson's life wasn't easy. And if you go into scripture, well, you can start reading about Abraham, mm -hmm. Joseph, all the apostles. The list is endless. Yes. As an example, let me quickly mention Abraham. Just a glance will show you he didn't become a great man of faith overnight. No. One Bible commentator said Abraham had to go through some difficult times before he reached the top of the mountain. But the bumps were what he climbed on. <laughs> Let me just run through some of the, the tests and the difficulties that he overcame. As soon as he arrived in Canaan, they had a famine. And this was the land that God had promised. They walked into a famine. And then he had problems with his nephew Lot. Then they had war. And Abraham had to go and do battle. Then his wife led him astray with bad counsel. And Ishmael was born. Mm. Incidentally, the whole world is still paying for that mistake. Yep. Finally, Isaac was born for a moment. He enjoyed great joy. Then God told him to go and sacrifice his son. Friends, his whole life was full of bumps. <coughs> Perhaps you need a little more evidence. Go and read the story of Moses. That ought to be sufficient. <laughs> now, I don't know what difficult you are going through. I don't know what bumps you have in your path, but I can assure you that I know the feeling. Some may feel like quitting because the path doesn't seem to be getting any easier. Perhaps some are screaming at God because he's not taking the bumps out of their path. Listen, if God did that, you might never get to the top. I don't think. God took the bumps out, you might never get to the top. Because we need the bumps to get to the top. They're what we climb on. Psalm 91 speaks of the care that God gives to his children. Verse 1 He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I don't know whether you're aware of it, but there are 11 different dangers mentioned in that psalm. War, snares, sickness, terror by night, 
hours by the day, but it just goes on. Yet God says, He can protect us from all of but that doesn't mean that we're never going to have an accident or an injury. No. But whatever happens in the will of God, all things will work together for good. Amen. 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 So let me add a word of explanation. The secret of having God's protection is remaining close to Him. Yes. You can't be under someone's shadow if you're not close to them. One can't afford to go running off into the world and expect to continue in God's care. No, we used to play a game when I was kids. We used to try treading on each other's shadows. But to do that, you've got to get close to them to do it. You can't suddenly have a lapse of faith when we just do our own thing Unless you are prepared to give up God's care. You can't have it both ways. No. It means having a closer walk with God, which may be a little inconvenient for those in rebellion, or who have not made a total commitment to the Lord. Mm. One of the great promises of Psalm 91 is to do with the stone. Verses 11 and 12. But he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Now listen, God never said he would make the way flat and smooth. No. He didn't say he would remove every obstruction. What he did say, he will help us to climb higher over the difficulty if we're willing to stay close to it. You see, there are those who want to use and treat God as a casual popping. The only time they want to know is when they've got a problem. They've got no interest while things are going smooth. The only time they become interested is when they want something. What blesses God is people who come to him not because they want something, but they just want to be near and in his company. Oh. And as a church, how many of you are aware of this? We're climbing the mountain of God, and how many of you know that we're going higher and higher, we're getting ever nearer. Amen. Sadly, and I've got to say this, it's true, the some are trying to get higher but the reason is that they believe it will benefit them or they'll be better off. Come on, Jesus, the only reason we climb is to get nearer to God. That's the only reason. Most of us respond to a stone in our path in a very predictable way. We complain. <laughs> don't tell me you don't complain. <laughs> We kick against them yes. and we end up hurting ourselves. We try to pick them up and get rid of them and very often we end up carrying them for the rest of our walk. And sometimes the problem can be so big that we can't find a way around it. What ends up? We stop. We decide we're going to have a rest. We stay there for the rest of our life. We don't go around, we just stay in that place. And some even give up and turn back. Listen, church, if we're close to God, then we don't have to give up. We can use the obstruction to climb even higher. I share that part of our problem is that we're creatures of comfort. We don't like anything, and please don't start disagreeing. We don't like anything spoiling our comfort zone. All right, none of us, we don't like our comfort zone being disturbed. We've become so used to the pain, smooth road 
But sadly, life is not made like that. Okay, sometimes the road is level and easy and the birds are singing and everything is wonderful. But other times, the road is full of rocks and bumps and there's no music, there's no pleasantness. Then what? We start complaining and eventually we can give up. Listen, that is the time for you and I to remember God's promise. For he shall give his angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways. Incredible as it seems. God has put his invisible, invisible army at our service. Some of you may remember a cartoon character called Charlie Brown. He was in the peanut strip. Yeah. And in one particular episode, he's complaining because his team never wins. <laughs> and Lucy answers him by saying, you learn more from your defeats than from any victory. And Charlie replied, that makes me the smartest man in the world. <laughs> Let's be serious. <coughs> Let's look at nature. If it was all sun, you'd have desert. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone ever lived in the desert? Yes. A week was enough for me. Yeah. If it rained all the time, we'd have floods. There's got to be a balance. And God knows that. You can't have laughter all the time. And that's why many succumb to using stimulants to keep themselves on a high. Then again, we don't want a life that's full of defeats either, do we? Right. And on the road, there are level places that delight us, and there are difficult places the challenges. The danger is if we try to do a detour to avoid the hard places, it normally takes us out from being under God's protection. How many of you drive? How many of you can drive a car? Give you away. Okay. Let me be practical. Let me use driving as an example. How often when there's been a hold up on the road? We've tried to take a detour. Yeah. <laughs> and we've ended up in a worse state. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a wave if you've done that. All right. It ends up the road becoming bumpy and narrow, and we end up going miles out of our way because we couldn't wait and work it out. Listen, it takes faith and courage to stay on God's highway. And it may appear at times to be easier to lash out and kick the rock and turn around and go back. <coughs> but I tell you, the secret of climbing higher is to look away from ourselves, look away from our difficulties, and look to God. Mm. Come back to Psalm 91. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him. But he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in times of trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. At the beginning, I suggested that we could look at people like Abraham, Joseph and Paul. But I want to use somebody better than that. Let's look at Jesus. All right, or what an example to look at. Amen. If you want to stay with me, I'm in Mark chapter 6. What kinds of problems and obstacles did Jesus face? Mark Gospel tells us that Jesus was even rejected from his hometown, Nazareth. 
It's a bit rough when you're kinfolk and your neighbours don't want to accept you. Mark 6, verse 7. Jesus said only in his own church amongst his relatives and his own house is a prophet with an honour. But in addition to that, he had national problems. Herod, King Herod, had put Jesus, his cousin John the Baptist, to death, and he wasn't too happy about Jesus' his ministry. And another problem that Jesus had was popularity. Jesus couldn't win a day off. No. Did you realise? He was so popular he couldn't get a day off. Mark 6 verse 31. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. But I'm going to say this to you. Perhaps the biggest difficulty that Jesus was facing was in his own camp. Yeah. Yeah. His disciples had so little faith that every time Jesus wanted to demonstrate his lordship over the world, it was his own followers that gave him the most grief. I don't know whether you know this, it's said that Walt Disney, have you heard of Walt Disney? Oh, yeah. He was such a visionary that he would only give his time and energy to a project if the entire board of directors were unanimous, unanimously against it. Uh, wow. I think he got the idea from Jesus. Life is an uphill battle. Come on, let's be honest about it. It is, isn't it? Anyone here who disagree with that? Life is an uphill battle. That's family, career, relationships, ministry. It's all a daily, living, breathing challenge, just trying to keep things under control. And it's sometimes tempting to adopt the philosophy according to Murphy. Have you heard of Murphy? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever can possibly go wrong will just grin and bear it. <laughs> Now, if you apply that to ministry, it would really be simple to focus on the obstacles to ministry. People, what did I say the other week? Wouldn't church be great without people? <laughs> <laughs> Never enough money, too many projects, not enough volunteers, sickness, Time constraints, the lack of interest in the community, they're all contrary winds. They're all winds blowing in the wrong direction. Do you understand that? Yeah. No. And without exception, I'll say this, every one of us has got those contrary winds blowing against us. And that's without exception. Yeah. Back to Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 45. The disciples rowing across the lake. But I want you to consider that it was Jesus who sent the disciples onto the lake. Yeah. He also understood so what was going to happen to them. Now why would he do it? Well, up until then, these disciples had been filled with doubt. And I believe he was going to show them who he was and he was going to confront their hard hearts. The word states, he saw them. And that word comes from the same root as know, which in the Bible means more than knowledge. Yeah. It's more about having experience. Yeah. Jesus understood fully what was happening to the disciples. He watched them straining at the oars. It was a real test for them. And by the fourth watch, that's between 3 and 6 a.m. in the morning, the disciples had been fighting the contrary winds. 
of the stall for between six and ten hours. Now you imagine that being on, long time. on a lake rowing for six to ten hours. Yeah, long time. How does Jesus know and understand my troubles? My friends, Jesus knows our troubles because he's been there. Jesus, like he could see beforehand that the disciples needed to be out on the storm tossed lake so that they could learn to trust him. He knew what was happening. And just like he could know me from before the foundation of the earth, and he wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Like he could look down through the annals of the existence and see the need of my heart and my life. Church, he knows your battle with the world. Yeah, he knows what you're going through. But the good news is this, is Jesus came to them in their trouble. Yes. Of course he did. But God who sees all and knows all about trouble is always going to come to you in your trouble. But there's an important usage of the word here. The phrase went out to them is without getting too technical, it's a, a Greek middle voice. It's only used for the present, which simply means there's no end to the action. Oh. So there's no end to Jesus' action. Jesus went to them and he kept going to them. He didn't stop and hallelujah the good news is he never stops. Whenever you've got a problem, there's no stopping Jesus. And how many of you know that if he's got to, you'd even walk on water to get to you? Yeah. In Mark 6, verse 50, it says, <coughs> and this is where he's walking out to them, because they all saw him and were terrified, and immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down and they were completely amazed. Mm. <coughs> when Jesus said it is I, don't be afraid, he's using that well-known phrase, I am. What problems do you have right now? What fears do you face? Is life a struggle? <clears throat> Is it a little bit more than overwhelming? If God was standing next to you right now, telling you not to be afraid, to cool it, to chill out, would you find it easier to get up tomorrow? Well, he is. Mm. It's as Amen. simple as that. Yeah. He is. Yeah. I don't know what you mean. How many of you know there's one more in this room than what the elders have counted this morning? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And his name is Jesus. Yeah. I am. But we forget it, don't we? Yes. And sometimes we have to be reminded that the, the disciples at that time were beginning to wonder about this strange rabbi that they were following. But when this man, they thought they'd seen a ghost, climbed into the boat and the wind ceased and the sea began to calm and the noise stopped, they realised what you and I need to see and adopt for our lives. When Jesus is here, you have all you need. Amen. I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to go into it in detail. But the Lord is pressing me to say something. Do you know where my life started? It was the night that Barbara received the miracle. It was the night that Doubting Thomas heard 
did everything he possibly could to disbelieve. It was the night when, despite all the hospital and the doctor's knowledge that I had, Barbara was totally healed, and that's 40 years ago, and to this day she still hasn't had the operation. Hallelujah. Yeah. But you know, sometimes all of us need that. It's like a wake-up call. When you suddenly see Jesus doing something. It certainly won't be him. I started living there. That's when I became a born-again Christian. Changed my life totally. Because I, I saw Jesus. Mm. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what winds are you, are you against right now? What peace do you need? We can be like the disciples. In verse 6, about 52, that the disciples were amazed. It was because they hadn't understood that their hearts were hardened or stony. Stony, cold hearts. And that's exactly what I had prior to the miracle. Realising that Jesus was there. You and I could be so like the disciples, hard-hearted against the plans and the blessings of God's leadership. Without faith, we build walls around our lives, even our hearts. We simply won't take courage and let go. So come on, church. What winds are against you this morning? Have you found yourself in the middle of a storm? Is life a bit rough at the moment? Answer the questions. Are you willing to look past the winds, ignore the noise and the waves of your trouble? Are you willing to look to Jesus who wants to come to you? Are you willing to let go of the safety of that boat that you've built for yourself? Are you ready to stop the ceaseless rowing against the contrary winds and let Jesus calm that storm within you? You see, God understands your storm and that's when God comes to you in the storm. He can put the storm to rest if you'll trust him. If you've got a Bible, I'm going to end with Hebrews 2. Three, two verses. Hebrews 2. Verses 2 and 3. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Amen? Amen. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. But more than that, let's let Jesus be near to us. Because you and I can keep him away. Let's do everything we can to let Jesus be here. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God.